This is Books of Titans, the podcast dedicated to the influences of influencers. The books that have helped shape prominent inventors, business leaders, athletes, intellectuals, scientists, and others. We'll talk about what makes these books such classics and at least attempt to have an intelligent discussion about what makes them so important and influential. Hello, this is Eric Rostad coming to you right outside of Nashville, Tennessee. Today, I'm going to cover the classic Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky. This is book 16 of 52 for my 2020 reading list. Now, Crime and Punishment is a novel. It is a work of fiction, and it explores a question. And that question is this. Can I commit one evil act for the greater good? Now, this question is explored through the main character, whose name is Raskolnikov, and he is this prideful 23-year-old ex-law student, and what he does is he plans to murder an old woman. Here are a few quotes from Raskolnikov that describe his, his thinking in this process, and here's the first one. I could kill that old woman and make off with her money, I assure you, without the faintest conscience prick. Kill her, take her money, and with the help of it, devote oneself to the service of humanity and the good of all. Would not one tiny crime be wiped out by thousands of good deeds? That's the end of that quote. The other quote is, But extraordinary men have the right to commit any crime and to transgress the law in any way, just because they are extraordinary. End quote. So one thing that he could potentially gain from murdering this old woman is 3,000 rubles. And he thinks that he could get his career off to where he could do a tremendous amount of good if he just had this, these 3,000 rubles, these $3,000. If he, if he could get that money, that would start him off on this path of, of being able to devote the rest of his life to doing good. He would just have to commit this small little indiscretion, this small little murder at the beginning, but then that would help him to do all these thousands of good deeds in the future. So that's that's the question in in the book, and, and I want to expand on that question just a little bit. So can on, on one level, it's it's the question of can can he do it and get away with it legally? So he, can he do it and, and not get caught by the police? And he's pretty convinced that he can, both because he's really smart and he thinks of himself as this great man. So that, that second quote I read where he says, but extraordinary men have the right to commit any crime and to transgress the law in any way just because they are extraordinary. And when he's thinking of that, he's thinking of Napoleon. And he's, he, he has this thought in his head that Napoleon did all these things later on in life that for the average man, that would have gotten him executed that would that would but executed by the state like he was so far outside of the law in, in doing these things later on in life but there had to have been but it, but it was for france you know it's for the greater good so it, it's look it's looked upon now as as perhaps uh good things that came out of that whereas raskolnikov is thinking but there had to have been some initial deed that napoleon did that he got away with it and from then on he could get away with everything else. So w- could he do that as well? So that that's the first question. Can I get away with it legally without being caught by the police? And Raskolnikov thinks he can. The second part of this question is, can he get away with it at the conscience level? Is is there a conscience? And that that's what deals with that in, in that first quote, where the, that conscience prick. Can can he kill the woman without without there being any damage to himself inside. So can he still look at himself in the mirror at night? And can the future good deeds outweigh the bad deeds, not just in society's eyes, but in his, in his own mind? That's the second part of that question. The third part of the question kind of expands out to the 10,000 foot level or 30,000 foot level. You're, you're up in the airplane kind of looking down at this point. And I, and I got this in, in talking with Jason, who you heard his voice at the beginning of, of the episode, but I was talking to him about this book a little bit. And and he was saying, you know, you take take an even further step back and what this question encompasses. Can I commit one evil act for the greater good? There's an assumption. And that assumption is God is dead. So if God is dead, does might make right? And again, this goes back to that that idea of, of Napoleon, the, the extraordinary man. Uh, can ex- But extraordinary men have the right to commit any crime and transgress the law in any way just because they are extraordinary. So... That's the third part of this question. Does might make right? Does the does later power wipe out the initial 
transgressions of the law to get to that point. So in the absence of right and wrong, or uh, of a conscience prick, as he calls it, does a level of morality work where power equals right? Or is there a law outside of that? You know, just your average book reading by the pool, you know, just basic uh, <laughs> action book or something. No, not really. It's, it is a heck of a question, and it's a brilliant medium in which to explore this question, the novel. So perhaps you've done this where you've read a book and you can just tell that the author has an agenda. And I, I call those books propaganda because if, if an author has an agenda at the beginning, especially in, in the form of a novel uh, of, of fiction, uh, you kind of tell where that author is using characters to do certain things to get to an idea uh, throughout the book. And so you contrast that idea of, of a book of propaganda versus a book of inquiry. And I would, I would say that this is more of a book of inquiry. Uh, Dostoevsky had that question, can, can one commit an evil act for the greater good? Just one evil act and, and have that be erased by the greater good. So this book is an exploration of that question. And I, I, I think of I, one of the books I read in 2017 on for this project, but, but on the idea of create, creativity, uh, the author said that when writing a book, the idea should be that you are on this this road and it's a, a foggy night and it's an old car and the headlight ha headlamps just not are what what they used to be so all you can really see is just barely right in front of you and you have got to be paying attention and y your mind is in it and in you can't see far enough ahead in the story but that's how one that's how an author should ap approach the writing of a book they should not go into it saying, I know that this character is going to do this and this and this, but it should be more of an explanation or an exploration of a question. And that's what this book is. And it is masterful. So in this episode, it's going to consist of three segments. We'll, we'll call this what I just said. That'll be first segment. And then uh, the second segment, what, I, what I'd like to do is, is dig a little deeper into this question. The can I commit one evil act for the greater good? And then also talk about uh, why I wanted to read this book. So that'll be segment two. There will not be any spoilers in w obviously what I just said. And then in segment two, there will be a ton of spoilers in segment three. So uh, you cannot you cannot talk about this book in in a in a good way without without spoiling what happens. So if you have not read it, I really want you to read this book. It is a classic. It is it is beautiful. It is amazing. I want you to read it, and I don't want you to have these spoilers going into it. So you're free to listen uh, to the next segment as well, but just know in segment three, I will be giving away spoilers. If you don't care about that or if you have, you've already read the book, uh, continue to listen on. But in, in segment three, I'm going to go through the one thing, my one key takeaway from this book. And then I'm going to go and, and, and do an overview of the whole book and how that question of can I commit one evil act for the greater good is answered by Dostoevsky through Raskolnikov in this epic novel. Have you ever asked yourself that question? Can I just do this one little thing? I know it's wrong, but the long-term benefits will surely outweigh this small little indiscretion. I think it's a question that we're confronted with on an almost daily basis. Maybe, in, in, and hopefully not on the level of, of murdering somebody, but maybe in small ways of, of telling a white lie for the greater good, or of not speaking up, or even thinking a part of the law does not apply to you. Uh, maybe you think you're a good guy or a good girl, and and you know, the, if, if, if I just do the small thing, it, it's okay, because it, it'll, it'll be fine down, down the road. Uh, it, it's something that we, we ask all the time. And, and it's a question as old as time. And it actually, as I was reading this book, I kept thinking about book one for my reading list this year, which was the Bible. I started off the year reading the Bible, it took two months. But in Genesis, uh, the story of Adam and Eve, I, I kept thinking about that in, in line with this question of, can I do one evil thing? Can I do one bad thing for the, for the greater good? And I think there's a sort of connection to the story 
of Adam and Eve. And now whether you believe in a literal Adam and Eve uh, or not, is it, that's not the point here. But let's, let's just look at, the, at that story, because I, I think the question and the theory posed by Rakol, Raskolnikov is, is similar. So in Genesis 3, we've got, or, or Genesis 2, there's a command where God tells Adam and Eve, you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And then in Genesis 3, there's a serpent who tells Eve, you will not die. If you eat this fruit, you, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. You will know good, knowing good and evil. And then uh, Eve eats the fruit, gives it to Adam. Adam eats the fruit, they eat it, and the eyes of both of them are, are opened. And I, I, I have not fully fleshed out idea, but I think there's something there. I think there's a connection point between those two questions. This, this idea that, can I just do this one thing to get, to get an advantage, to, to have maybe a, a higher level of, of consciousness? consciousness uh, can I do this one thing? And there's a very interesting quote towards the, towards the three-fourths into the, into the book where uh, Raskolnikov is, is in front of a police investigator and the police investigator makes the statement, you made up a theory and then were ashamed that it broke down and turned out to be not at all original. Turned out to be not at all original, end, end quote. And I, I love that because I think it kind of made that connection point and, and the connection point I'm trying to make here as well of don't just look at that question as, as uh, way, you, you know, high level philosophy or something, uh, can I do one evil thing and get away with it? But, but think of it in terms of this is a question that you deal with every day. This is a question that we all deal with. And if you read the book through that lens, it, it takes on a whole new meaning. It, yes, it's a fantastic story, but when you realize that, that this is something that you deal with daily, it, it, I, I think it's a good way to, to enter in to this book. So I want to go into a little bit just more of why I read this book and, and that sort of thing, uh, and that'll close out segment two before we get into the, the one thing in segment three. So this is a book that I first read in 1999, and so this was the first time I reread Crime and Punishment. This was one of the first, uh, actually, this was the first classic novel that I ever read for fun. I had to read some books in high school, and I didn't like them. and And uh, I'm actually reading rereading some of those this year just to see if it's a different experience of uh, not liking it in high school, but but reading it for fun and just seeing that difference. But this, uh, if you go back to the other episode of, of the Sacred Romance, that that is the book that really kind of got my interest in in reading classical literature. But after reading the Sacred Romance, uh, a book I, I reread earlier this year, my first book I read after that was was this Crime and Punishment. And I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know how to approach classic literature. Uh, I, you know, it, it was my first experience of just reading for pleasure and reading a classic for pleasure. And I was absolutely blown away by this book. And this, this really started my love of literature. I started reading a lot of other classics after Crime and Punishment, but this was, this was the first one. So this, it, it already has a special place in my heart, but I had not read it in over 20 years. So this was the first time rereading it. It is a 449-page book, at least the version that I had, and uh, un, unabridged. So I read the, the, the whole thing. Uh, I, I would assume you can get some abridged versions, which are shorter. Uh, the 449 pages took me 17 hours and 44 minutes to read, and that was over a 14-day period. And I like to share that just because I, I read quite slowly, and just to give you an idea of, of how long it might take to, to read the book. And it, it was actually funny rereading it because I, I remember specific parts of the book, but I had them in the wrong order in my mind and, and even had the, the wrong person doing different things. So it, it's just kind of funny how that uh, you can get the wrong ideas in your head or, or remember a, a book incorrectly. But um, Dostoevsky does such a great job in this book that at times you feel like you're the one who committed the crime. I mean, I would be reading this book at night and I, I would just feel my heart racing. And it's like, I'm the one that that is being pursued. I'm the one that ha that's having these thoughts in my mind. And it, he does such an amazing job that you that you really do feel it. And, that, and that's one reason I started off this, this segment with that, 
uh, this that idea of, of of not thinking that this is some question way out in philosophy land, but but it's something that we deal with with daily, uh, because you'll feel your heart racing while you're while you're reading this. Um, one suggestion I do have is that you you print out a list of the characters, that'll help you. I'll, I'll put some in the in I'll, I'll put a PDF in the show notes that that has a list of the characters. Um, but this is it's it's a Russian novel. It's I obviously re- read the translated uh, version in in English, but the character names are all in Russian, and they're all most of the people have names that are three part names, so a first, middle, and last name, but depending on the context and who is addressing them, they go by different names. So in, in one one part, uh, the person may go by the last name, but then in another part, the first name. And it gets really confusing if, if you don't have that list in front of you. So uh, that's one thing I would suggest if you do read it, to just print that off, have it with you. I just put it right inside the book, and any time I read it, I would just have it sitting next to me because it, it gets quite complex, and uh, that'll really help you out is just having that list of, of, of uh, characters there. Uh, I, I remember thinking this the first time I read it as well. This should be a book that is read, that is required reading for law enforcement. So whether it's police officers or investigators, you get insight into a criminal's mind that is so incredible. It's so uh, enlightening. And I, I, I just think it would help law enforcement in, in how they they approach uh solving cases and, and all that like it's it's just amazing to to go in you, you are in this you are in R- raskolnikov's head and it's uncomfortable it's scary but there there is a lot to learn there to recap this is one of my favorite novels i've ever read uh for for people trying to get into literature it, it's a bit long maybe for a first first novel or first work of fiction to get into but it is it is phenomenal, and and I, I, I really hope that you uh, you read it at some point in your life. So on to segment three, and remember there will be spoilers in this section. So if you've not read the book and you want to experience it, uh, let me put it a different way. I want you to experience this book. It is powerful. I don't want you to go into it knowing what happens. So if you've not read the book, I would strongly encourage you to pause this episode, read the book, and come back to the episode when you have finished the book. Um, It'll make it a much more powerful experience for you reading the book. With that, uh, I'm going to go into segment three, which which is my one thing, my one key takeaway from the book that I'm reading. And oftentimes with novels, that becomes more of a, a thing instead of like, you know, how, what one thing can I implement in my life uh, or change in my life? What habit could I change? With novels, it's more of what is still bouncing around in my head after finishing this book. What is the one thing that I, I can't get out of my head that I keep thinking about? So that's what I'm going to start out here. And then after that, I'm going to go into how Dostoevsky answers that question of can I, can a bunch of good deeds outweigh a one initial evil deed. So let's get into the one thing. Remember Raskolnikov, the main character in the book, he thought he was above the law. Remember that quote at the beginning, but extraordinary men have the right to commit any crime and to transgress the law in any way just because they are extraordinary. So what ultimately convinced Raskolnikov of his crime? Was it the law? Because remember, he, th- he thought he was above the law. He thought he could commit this murder and not get in trouble with the law. So did the law ultimately convince him that he had committed this crime? Well, <laughs> towards the end of the book, I mean, I'm, in, in the last parts of the book, he, we see him. He is in a Sibi- Siberian prison. He has is, he is confessed to his crime, but he has not repented of his crime. And there's a difference that he he says he committed the murder, but he still does not believe it is wrong. He has not repented. He has not changed his idea of what he had done because he's in a Siberian prison and he still doesn't think what he did was wrong. So what ultimately convinced him that what he had done was wrong? And here's my one key takeaway, but it was love. Love convinced him 
that what he had done was wrong. And I, I know that is the cheesiest sounding thing that I could say, but it's not this summer of love idea or, Hey, let's just love everybody, man. It's, it's not that it is, it is, it is a woman that follows him to Siberia to, to be with him. She obviously can't be in the prison with him, but she is going to live next to the prison for seven years while he is in prison. And that is what ultimately changes him. It is this deep kind of love, uh, what the law was powerless to do. It's that idea, it's, it's, it's this love that, that changes. So that, that's my one key takeaway. Uh, you're reading the whole book and you're, and you're you think, is he going get, to get away with this? Like, is his question, uh, you know, is that th- this one murder, is he going to get a, get away with that uh, on the legal front or from his conscience? And then to be able to go on in life and do these great things that he, that he thought getting the money from this one evil deed would, would allow him to do. Will he be able to do it? Will he be able to get away from it from the law? Like, will he ever get caught? What about from his conscience? So at the end, we see that His conscience leads him to confess. And then by confessing, the law leads him to prison. But the law does not cause a renewal in his mind. Uh, The law does not convince him of what he he had done and that it was wrong. Only love does that. And it's an extraordinary lesson. It's It's an unbelievable way that Dostoevsky ends the book. So let, let's go, let's go in. I'm, I'm just going to kind of do an overall uh, view, uh, top level view of what happens in this book, how that question is answered. And let's just start by looking at the title of the book, Crime and Punishment. As I mentioned before, the book is 449 pages. The murder is committed on page 62. The legal punishment, him being sent to prison in Siberia, is, ad- is administered in the epilogue. The epilogue is the final 10 pages of the book. So what happens in between there? You've got the murder on page 62. You've got going to prison on page 440. What happens in those 380 pages? You have the mental punishment. That is the body of the book. Raskolnikov uh, contemplates suicide. He makes the statement, I murdered myself when I murdered that woman. So you've got, you've got an entire book. The punishment is the conscience prick. The punishment is the mental anguish. The law, the punishment by the law, does not happen until the very end. So it's an amazing book in that sense. When, when especially when you think of it in terms of the the title itself. So let's let's start from the beginning and go through the book and and see how this question is answered. See the path that Dostoevsky took. To answer that question that uh, the main character, Raskolnikov, have, had. So from the very first page, page one of the book, we meet Raskolnikov and we see a man who is prideful and lonely. He's so absorbed in himself that he is isolated from his fellow his fellow people. I mean, it, when he's at school, people don't like him. Uh, in life, he has very few friends. We meet those friends, but he's, he's effectively alone. From page one, we also see him contemplating a great crime to see if he's capable of doing it. 40 pages in, we see, we see Raskolnikov, uh, a description of him where the author Dostoevsky says, he longed to forget himself altogether, to forget everything, and then to wake up and begin life anew. So you've got this, this lonely, prideful man contemplating a crime Yet, deep down, he also longs to just start over, just to just be renewed, to have to to start life anew. Page sixty uh, in in the sixties, he commits the murder of the old woman, and while he's doing that, the old woman's half sister walks in, and so he also has to murder her, and that was not something he anticipated, and so he it is a double murder. Rita. Uh, statement or a, a, a quote from page 65 and this is right before the murder or actually this is right after right after the murder and he, he's thinking and uh and and here's the quote 
If he could have understood how many obstacles and perhaps crimes he still had to overcome or to commit to get out of that place and to make his way home, it is very possible that he would have flung up everything and would have gone to give himself up, and not from fear, but from simple horror and loathing of what he had done. This is immediately after the murder. Right above that, it said, fear gained more and more mastery over him, especially after the second quite unexpected murder. And then, and then just that, if he could have understand, uh, understood how many obstacles and other crimes he would have had to commit to get out of this place, he would have, he would have turned in himself in right then. So that's immediately after the murder, and he's al- there's already this sense of panic. So this, this, I, uh, this idea, of, could he get away with it without the conscience prick? It's not working out very well for him. He goes home from the murder. His body shuts down. He's sick. He becomes paranoid. Uh, One of the statements says, a deadly sensation passed over his soul. Here's some other quotes. So from pages 70 to, to 90, the conviction that all his faculties, even memory and the simplest power of reflection were failing him began to be an insufferable torture. A gloomy sensation of agonizing, everlasting solitude and remoteness to conscious form in his soul. Repulsion of everything around him. Infinite terror as he had never experienced before. He, as I mentioned before, he said, I murdered myself, not her. About halfway through the book, almost at the exact midway point, there's a scene where Sonia, who is a prostitute, reads the story of Lazarus, from the New Testament to Raskolnikov. At this point, uh, Raskolnikov has not told Sonia that he is the murderer. They're they're kind of getting to know each other, uh, and, and despite her being a prostitute, it's not it's not a sexual level. It's just they're they're uh, they're, they're they're both criminals in 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 a sense uh, where she's a prostitute and he is this murderer, and so that they're they're drawn they're drawn to each other. And so she reads the story of Lazarus, and, and I want to read this part. Uh, she she know, she starts to read because uh, it says that she only knows that this man is infinitely unhappy, and so she begins to read this story. And there's this just this amazing part. Uh, it's just one paragraph here. That is all about the raising of Lazarus, she whispered severely and abruptly, and turning away, she stood motionless, not daring to raise her eyes to him. She still trembled feverishly. The candle end was flickering out in the battered candlestick, dimly lighting up the poverty-stricken room, the murderer and the harlot who had so strangely been reading together the eternal book. Five minutes or so passed. And it's just this amazing scene in the book, and you think back to that comment of Raskolnikov's on, on page 41, he says, I, it, it says uh, in description of him, he longed to forget himself altogether, to forget everything, and then to wake up and begin life anew. And here's the story of Lazarus, a man who dies, and then Jesus raises him from the dead. Here's a story of renewal, and it has an impact on, on Raskolnikov. Later on, he asks, well, what am I to do now? So Raskolnikov asks Sonia, what what am I supposed to do? This is after he's told her that he is the murderer. And here's what she said. This is unbelievable. What are you to do? She cried, jumping up in her eyes that had been full of tears suddenly began to shine. Stand up. She seized him by the shoulder. He got up, looking at her almost bewildered. Go at once this very minute, stand at the crossroads, bow down, first kiss the earth which you have defiled, and then bow down to all the world and say to all men aloud, I am the murderer. Then God will send you life again. You will go. Will you go? Will you go? She asked him, trembling all over, snatching his two hands, squeezing them tight in hers and gazing at him with eyes full of fire. Don't be a child, Sonia, he said softly. What, what wrong have I done? Why should I go to them? What should I say to them? That's only a phantom. They destroy men by millions themselves and look on it as a virtue. They are knaves and scoundrels, Sonia. I'm not going to them. And what should I say to them? That I murdered her? That I did not dare to take the money and hid it under a stone? He added with a bitter smile. Why, they would laugh at me and would call me a fool for not getting it. A coward and a fool. They wouldn't understand and they don't deserve to understand. Why should I go to them? I won't. 
Don't be a child, Sonia. So we see what, what is required of him, uh, what Sonia said is, to, is required, and, and it's to, to, to go to the crossroads, bow down, first kiss the earth which you have defiled, and then bow down to all the world and say to all men aloud, I am a murderer. So it's to confess his crime, it's to, to go into the center of the city and confess his crime. And he, as, we, as you can see, he is not willing to do that. Later on, he's talking to a police investigator who, who believes that Raskolnikov did the crime. And that, uh, that investigator says that you must surrender and confess. Dostoevsky makes a, a, an amazing statement in the book. He says, nothing in the world is harder than speaking the truth and nothing easier than flattery. So later on, we're starting to get towards the end here. And Raskolnikov still does not see what he has done as a crime. Crime? What crime? He cried in sudden fury. That I killed a vile, noxious insect, an old and old pawnbroker woman of no of use to no one? Killing her was atonement for forty sins. She was sucking the life out of the poor people. Was that a crime? Am I not thinking of it? And am I not thinking of expiating it? And why are you all rubbing it in on all sides? A crime? A crime? Only now I see clearly the imbecility of my my cowardice. Now that I've decided to face this this superfluous disgrace, it's simply because I'm contemptible and have nothing in me that I've decided to to perhaps to for my advantage as that Porphyry, Porphyry suggested. I only wanted to put myself into an independent position to take the first step to obtain means, and then everything would have been smoothed over by benefits immeasurable in comparison. If I had succeeded, I should have been crowned with glory. I am further than ever from seeing that what I did was a crime. End quote. And I I, kind of jumped around there of of different things he was saying, but we still see, I mean, there's uh, at this point, there are 20 pages left in the book, and he is nowhere near seeing what he did as a crime. But then uh, a a few pages later, it says he suddenly recalled Sonia's words, go to the crossroads, bow down to the people, kiss the earth for you have sinned against it too. And say aloud to the whole world, I am a murderer. He trembled remembering that and the hopeless misery and anxiety of all that time, especially of the last hours had weighed so heavily upon him that he positively clutched at the chance of this new unmixed complete sensation. It came over him like a fit. It was like a single spark kindled in his soul and spreading fire through him. Everything in him softened at once and the tears started in his eyes. He fell to the earth on the spot. He knelt down in the middle of the square, bowed down to the earth and kissed that filthy earth with bliss and rapture. He got up and bowed down a second time. He's boozed, a youth near him observed. End quote. So here he does what she asks. He uh, does not say that I'm the murderer yet, but he, he does kiss the ground, but the, the people around him think he's just been, been drinking. So after that, uh, he does go to the police officer, the, the police station, and he goes in with the intention of, of confessing the crime. But once he gets there, he finds out that the only person, the only other person other than Sonia that knew he had done the crime and and said that he was going to tell others had committed suicide. So that, that one person, uh, it it, it was Raskolnikov no longer felt the urgency of confessing because the, the person who knew was dead and would not give, give him up. So he walks out of the police office, but he sees Sonia on the street and he turns around and here's what happened. He went down and out into the yard. There, not far from the entrance, stood Sonia, pale and horror-stricken. She looked wildly at him. He stood still before her. There was a look of poignant agony, of despair in her face. She clasped her hands. Her lips worked in an ugly, meaningless smile. He stood still a minute, grinned, and went back to the police office. It was I killed the old pawnbroker woman and her sister, Lizaveta, with an axe and robbed them. It was I. So he, he finally confesses to his, to his crime. After that, we get into the epilogue. And the next thing we see is a description of why he confessed. 
or, or no, he's, he is in prison at this point because, because of that confession, but he is not, he is not repentant. He, he does not, he still doesn't think what he's done is wrong. So it says here, it was wounded pride that made him ill. And taking myself out of the quote for a second, he's, he's in prison, but he's, he, he has been ill for a long time in, in prison. Uh, but it was wounded pride that, that made him ill. And then back into the quote, his exasperated conscience found no particularly, particularly terrible fault in his past, except a simple blunder, which might happen to anyone. End quote. So we see that he is still unrepentant at this point. He, he just thinks uh, it was a simple blunder. And we're looking at six pages left to go in the book, and he still doesn't think that what he did was wrong. He, he thinks he is in the right. So the idea of punishment by law, of him being in Siberia, of him being in prison, that did not convince him. The law was not able to convince him of this crime. So now we go, go to the second to last page in the book. And it says, how it happened, he did not know, but all at once something seemed to seize him and fling him at her feet. He wept and threw his arms around her knees. And this is Sonia. He, he wept and threw his arms around Sonia's knees. For the first instant, she was terribly frightened and she turned pale. She jumped up and looked at him, trembling. But at the same moment, she understood and a light of infinite happiness came into her eyes. She knew and had no doubt that he loved her beyond everything and that at last the moment had come. They wanted to speak, but could not. Tears stood in their eyes. They were both pale and thin, but those sick pale faces were bright with the dawn of a new future and of a full resurrection into a new life. They were renewed by love. The heart of each held infinite sources of life for the heart of the other. That's the end of that quote. It's not all happy uh, and, and happy-go-lucky and love lovey-dovey at the end. Uh, they, he is still has seven more years in his sentence. But this is the last part. This is the last two paragraphs. He did not know that the new life would not be given him for nothing, that he would have to pay dearly for it, that it would cost him great striving, great suffering. But that is the beginning of a new story, the story of the gradual renewal of a man, the story of his gradual regeneration, of his passing from one world into another, of his initiation into a new unknown life. That might be the subject of a new story, but our present story is ended. Wow. I mean, such an incredible book. Raskolnikov had this theory, but he also had this desire for a renewed life. His theory, his question, it failed him. He didn't know it until the very end. He got that renewed life that he longed for, but as we just read, it was not without pain or suffering. It was through tremendous pain and suffering, not only for himself, but many others. And we meet many of those others in the, in the book to, to say nothing of the, the two women he murdered. He couldn't murder without that conscience prick. And the one evil deed did not outweigh tremendous good later on. And in fact, he was not able to do any of the good later on because of that one evil deed. So crime and punishment. The crime was obvious. The punishment was extended. The punishment was not what he expected. And the punishment by law did not change him. I wrote the following proverb on the title page of this book. It comes from Proverbs 28, 17. And it says, A man tormented by the guilt of murder will be a fugitive till death. Let no one support him. I just had a friend tell me that this book was instrumental in his journey of faith. This book was actually banned in, in Soviet uh, Russia at different points. Uh, some, sometimes it would be... Uh, Dostoevsky would be lauded as, a, as a, a great author and, you know, great Russian, but then other times it was banned. And part of the reason uh, for it being banned was because the main character, Raskolnikov, reads the New Testament at the end of the book, and, and it's part of that transformation. It's part of that renewal of life. So to recap, this is a fantastic work of literature. It's a classic. You may read it and your heart just may be racing. You may be so engaged in, in the story. You'll be confronted with difficult ideas and topics, but it will be worth it. This is one of my favorite novels of all time. All right, that's going to do it for this episode. Thank you for listening. I'd love to hear from you. I've actually been starting to get uh, getting more uh, uh, letters and, and emails, and I, I really appreciate that. 
So I'm serious when I say, uh, when I say that. You can email me at eric at booksoftitans.com. That's eric, E-R-I-K, at booksoftitans.com. You let me know what you thought of this episode or this book or, or any of the other ones. Uh, some of the people writing are actually writing as a tool to help them remember what they read. So they're telling me about the books that they're reading in an effort to just have another avenue of, of, of recalling what is in the books. <laughs> I'm loving reading through those. And uh, so I do encourage you to, to write to me. Uh, you can also go to booksoftitans.com and on the contact page is my post office box where you can send a letter, a, a written letter directly. I'd appreciate that as well. You can follow Books of Titans on Instagram or Twitter, uh, both at Books of Titans. Also, the website is stocked full of resources to help you find books and to create your own reading list. I'll be back next uh, in, in two weeks uh, discussing another book from my 2020 reading list. And until then, keep reading, keep learning, and keep listening. I'm out.